How's it going, guys? Welcome back to Blue Shooting. Welcome back to House of Fata Morgana. Uh, reincarnation or Remnant's Dreams, whatever you want to call it. But we are back. Last time we ended with the first half, I guess, or part one of A Slice of Sweet Serenity of Days Long Lost. Like, that was the one with Jacopo when he found that Morgana had gotten sick and he takes her home to take care of her. And she's having, like, a very severe fever and just kind of his recollections, his thoughts and feelings of that situation. It was very sweet, kind of creepy. You know, again, she's really young for him to have fallen in love with her, but I mean, we'll get past it for the sake of a story. So yeah, now we're gonna be doing this part two. I don't know if it's gonna be tied to it or if it's gonna be made from Morgana's perspective, not too sure. Uh, but yeah, like I think we're just gonna jump right in, just kind of see how far we get. We don't have very many short stories left before we can jump into like the real meat and potatoes of reincarnation, so. Hope you guys are enjoying. Let's get back, relax, and just see how it plays out. Let's get started. A slice of sweet serenity of days long lost too. Felt like a nightmare after nightmare. Dreams of my mother abandoning me. Yep, it's, this is Morgana's. Of nobles mocking me. Of that terrible lord drinking my blood. Of filthy men in the slums gagging at the sight of me. But no matter how many times I tried, th I, uh, they threatened to swallow me up. Cat. My cat's freaking out for some reason. I don't know if you can hear him or not. Depends, like, the microphone's really good about only being proximity based, and so stuff that's beyond, like, a bubble tends to not get picked up unless it's loud. So, who knows? You might, I might sound crazy, but my cat is, like, got the zoomies, and he's meowing at me, so I don't know what's up with him. Like, you're okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. But no matter how many times they threatened to swallow me up, there was always a hand there, holding me in place. It was a man's hand, large and strong, but soft and gentle. It could only belong to one person. Mm -hmm. I slowly drifted back to reality. My head still hurt a little, but it wasn't as hard to breathe anymore, and I could see clearly again. Pale blue moonlight seeped into the room through the window. I pushed myself up on the bed, a little too hard though. The weight I was used to being there was gone, causing me to misjudge the push and stumble. I looked down to find myself in a white robe I didn't recognize. It was light and breezy, and felt nice on my skin. Lifting my arms up, the fabric made a pleasant rustling sound. My hair had also been let down, the braid undone for all of it, and all of it's brushed. I gripped the, my right hand shut and loosened it again, repeating the action several times. It felt slightly warmer than the left, as if someone had been holding it while I slept. Looking around, I realized where I was. It's his home. I had been here a month earlier, around the same time of the Midsummer Festival, and the ceiling above me looked exactly the same as it did back then. Compared to the almost sickly sweet aroma of the women in the brothel, it smelled almost earthy and rugged here. That alone was enough to tell me it was a man's home. I mean, yeah. What I didn't know, though, was why I was here. I'd woken up this morning feeling unwell, so I went to the graveyard to rest by a tree, but couldn't remember anything after that. Oh, you're up. How are you feeling? There was another presence in the moonlit room. As it drew closer, its silhouette grew clearer. In the past, I would have braced myself at the sight of a man, no matter who, approaching me in the dark, but I was able to stay relatively calm now. The moon shining through the solitary window was the only source of light. Candles were a luxury most couldn't afford in the slums. And in this pale light, I could see his face twisted into a frown. Not an angry frown, though. One of concern. I had learned to tell the two apart in the two, half year, in the two and a half years since we'd met. Though I would never admit it. Gazing absently at him, a number of questions left to mind. Had he brought me here? Had he watched over me the whole night? Had he been the one holding my hand? Would you care to explain what I'm doing here? But the question did they, that actually made it, out, made it out surprised even me with how callous it sounded. Hey, you need to learn to show some gosh darn gratitude. You're here because you decided to drag your dumb sick butt to the graveyard and pass out there. It's like some stupid misguided attempt to protect the girls of the brothel. I brought you to my place so you didn't die out there in the heat. Let me give you a hint. Two words. Rhymes with thank you. I never asked for your help. You couldn't be any more impossible if you were- if you tried. What happened to the girl from this afternoon? What? 
<sighs> Nothing. Don't, don't worry about it. I tilted my head in confusion, and he clenched his lips and averted his gaze. I hoped he ha I hadn't said or done anything in the few hours I'd lost. A mix of worry and humiliation gripped, gripped, gra grappled inside me, pulling me back and forth between wanting to ask and not wanting to know anything. Anyway. But before I could make a decision for myself, he changed the subject. At least you've recovered enough to put that sharp tongue of yours back into action, he said with a smirk. I had no idea what to say. Clearly, he had looked after me when I wasn't able to look after myself. For that, he deserved thanks, but I couldn't actually put that into words. And even worse, I was afraid whatever I said next would only upset him more. You haven't eaten anything all day. You must be starving. I'm not... Before I could finish the sentence, though, my stomach let out a deep rumble. My eyes went, inside, went wide, and I gave him the desperate look, then dropped my gaze to my hands. I couldn't believe that had happened. My stomach growling in hunger like an ordinary girl. It was humiliating. I stared down at my clenched fists for what felt like an eternity, unable to bring myself to look up at him. When I heard my muffled snicker from above, I wanted to snap at him for laughing at me, but I couldn't even manage that. Come here. He grabbed a chair and placed it by the window. I knew it was only because that was the only source of light in the room, but still, I was hesitant to step out of the darkness without a hood to cover my face. I could see so much more of the world than usual. Standing in the moonlight, he was illuminated from head to toe, and I could even make out the details on his face. He was smiling gently, not smirking or glaring or frowning as I had expected. His eyes, the color of fallen leaves, narrowed just slightly. What's gotten into you? There was always a hint of, des of des uh, derision in his smile. There was always a trace of contempt in his words. He was short-tempered and quick to shout. He was obsessed with logic and always complained about feelings. So why was he being so... None of that now. You're the worst. He hadn't done a thing wrong, and yet everything felt wrong. It, was play it, was it wasn't playing fair for him to only be nice to me now. It was so cowardly for him to only smile at me like that now. The kind of irritation I didn't know how to describe began pooling within me. Nothing was making sense anymore. And I didn't know who I could ask to explain it either. So it just built up, up, and up. To the point that it was almost hard to breathe. To the point that I almost felt sick. And unflattering as it was to describe my own feelings that way. But it scared me, not knowing what any of it was. Would I even have an answer? Would I ever have a name for this feeling? Would the day ever come that I could feel comfortable in it? And would I even be me if I did? I certainly couldn't imagine myself there yet, ever, with that kind of confidence, smiling like him, being sociable like Marie or, or Jaren. Are you just going to sit there and stare off into space? Whatever. I always had my hood up and my head turned down, so I almost never had the chance to look at him so unobstructed. Which reminded me how much older than me he was. He was an adult and I was just a kid. He didn't have to look after me either, but he did, for whatever reason. And who knew how long that would even last. He could very well go off and do something else with his life, somewhere far away, before I figured anything out. So, um... I said. The thoughts just kept coming and coming, almost sending me to a panic. He frowned slightly, tilting his head. And every second I couldn't figure out what to say next, his frown deepened. But his patience never ran out. He stood there, and waited. Which reminded me, once not long after we first met, when I still considered him a potential threat, he'd done the same thing. Waited for me to speak, despite not being a patient man at all. In four years? What? In four years? How old will you be? What? Can't you do the math yourself? Anyway, I'll be 26 four years from now. 26. Hearing that number put in perspective how just how far ahead of me he was. By then, he could have a loving wife and children. And why wouldn't he? That was what people did at that phase in their lives. What... What will you be doing then? Hell if I know. What kind of a question is that? I mean, I'd at least like to be done scraping by every day of my life by then. Another four years is the mo is, it, of this is more than I can take. Oh. What, what's gotten into you? He said with a sigh. <sighs> I 
I turn up to face him. Words dance on the tip of my tongue. If he could just wait for, no, one year. If he could just stay here in this confined life he hated so much, not trying to go out of the world he loved to talk about. One year was all I needed. That would be enough time to make sense of myself. To convince myself I was a regular girl like anyone else. And to figure out what on earth I actually felt about him. I knew I would just be holding him back. Why should he care about accommodating the wishes of a hideous girl like me? But if he could just wait a year. Just one year. Morgana. All I had to do was say it, and he would take a huge weight off my shoulders. But I couldn't bring myself to put those thoughts into words. Not because I didn't want to, or because I was too embarrassed to, but because the act of asking for something still held so much weight for me. Are you still feeling under the weather? Is that it? Perhaps... so. Dang. Then you'll want something light, I'm guessing. I got some fruit from the bar uh, barmaid at the pub. He stepped over toward me, holding out his hand. It was large and bony, nothing like my own hand. And in it, he held an apple, which I accepted with both hands. He'd managed to get me new clothes and food, which I knew wasn't easy given our circumstances. And as much as he yelled about me thanking him, he never once tried to guilt me about everything he'd done for me. Not him, nor the girls at the brothel. Don't get too generous, I said, carrying the apple to my mouth. I have no way of paying you I have no way of paying you back. My help isn't an investment I'm looking for returns on. You know that perfectly well. Or are you starting to feel guilty? That's cute, he said with a chuckle. Instead of replying, I bit into the apple. Its sweet juices filled my mouth. If you want to pay me back, just remember to say something nice over my grave. I know you've got a soft spot for the dead. Sure. I giggled, holding the apple in front of my mouth as he couldn't, uh, so he couldn't see it. Apparently, he still remembered the time I told him, If you want me to be nice to you, go die. But the truth was... I'd wanted to do something for him in life, in return to ever since before then. And I hope you live a long life. That way I won't have to worry about showing you any kindness for many years. You're really against the idea of being nice to me, huh? He said, frowning. More than you could ever imagine. God, no mercy. But alright, fine, I'll live a long life. And so will you, and Marie, and Jaren, and the dumb Gratine, and all our other friends. Right. I handed the half-eaten apple back to him, guessing he hadn't eaten for almost as long as me. And after a few moments of hesitation, he accepted it, taking a large bite out of the untouched side. I watched quietly, some part of me certain that we would have many more occasions just like this. And thus, and the sweet taste of the apple still lingered in my mouth as I whispered, to a long life for all of us. Man, what a downer. I think that's really one of the first true indications of like how she felt for him. Like she didn't really know how she felt for him for a while. Like, and it's fair, like she was really young, didn't really have a lot of room for that kind of thought. But the game always kind of implied that like she did feel something for him and cared about him but that it was like undeveloped and i guess that kind of matches what we just saw there but that meant it always felt really one-sided which made a lot of sense because she was so young but i feel like the game's trying to prime us for perhaps in reincarnation i wonder if they're going to end up like crossing paths again despite her pre uh, protests of the idea after she, like, goes down the deep end. But that was a cute part of the story. Alright, let's go to the Ghost of Rose Manor. The Ghost of Rose Manor. Hi there, ladies and gents and everything in between. I'm your run-of-the-mill landscape painting, but you can call me Mr. Canvas. Oh, this is gonna be, uh... Wait, haven't we already read this one? Today, I'd like to talk about my time with the Rhodes family. Oh. I lived in- I- back at the time of Hayden Rhodes, I hung in the first floor drawing room. The old man was rather fond of me, if I do say so myself. This was the only piece of art left in the house when I bought it, he liked to tell everyone. But once that big troublemaker of a painter showed up and his work started to fill the house, things got a little disagreeable for me there. 
He was a trend chaser, and that didn't suit my style much. Okay, so no, we didn't read this, but we read a similar story. This is the locked away presence of Michelle's brother. Well, no, that can't be right. No, it is right. The locked away, like, soul of Michelle's brother, um, not Dieter, uh, George's. He was the painting. So, at this point, he was the painting that was, this is his point of view being a painting for during the the prelude and then the story of the reincarnation of Nelly and Ren. Uh, no, Mel, not Ren. I don't know where Ren came from. Sorry about that. Anyway, he was a trend chaser. That didn't really suit my style. So before long, I got moved off to an out-of-the-way corridor where I was subject to some horrible mistreatment. I tremble in my frame thinking about what that smarmy little child in her grisly, furly dress did to me that day. Of whom I do speak, you ask? Why, my great and terrible arch nemesis, the young Nellie Rhodes, of course. Her brow furrowed and her lip pursed. The small one glowered at me for a few moments before saying, I've always hated this painting. It's so dreadfully old-fashioned. Can you believe the gall of this girl? She then lifted me off the wall and said, No one's going to miss this hideous thing anyway. Now I consider myself to have a pretty good handle on my wits, but you can bet I was sweating like a pig over her trying to throw me away. Which is why Nellie let out a little squeal and dropped me to the floor. Ew, it's all wet and gross. Oh, dearest Mel, I need your help. After a few moments howling to herself, Nellie scampered off, leaving me all alone with no way to get up. And just like that, I was sure to be the end of me. Someone lifted me off the floor. It was the white-haired girl. The soft touch of her hand made my heart skip a beat. And I mean, it wouldn't in my position. She looked so much like... Then, with a faint smile, he, she said, Let's bring you somewhere safe. And carried, and carried me, wrapped tight in her arms, to the second floor. She seemed to know where all the best nooks and crannies in the house were tucked away. After hanging me up somewhere nice and out of the way, the white-haired girl said, There, that should do it. I just couldn't believe such a lovely pa I couldn't bear to see such a lovely painting throw away. What a sweetheart she was. Nellie could have stood to learn a thing or two from her. You look like a garden, or perhaps a field somewhere. You're beautiful, and I'd love to see it in person someday. Oh, girl, I'd love nothing more than to take you there myself. It was a lovely area for horseback riding, and the shade beneath the tree was perfect for a picnic. That e that's, that's even where you... Whoops. No. Wrong person. I seem to have mixed the white-haired girl up with someone else. We all did. I think we all did. I let out a chuckle no one could hear. And as I watched her walk away, I said a little prayer. May your life be filled with joy. He hadn't been allowed to have that much, so I hoped at least she, his spinning image, could. Is that really all that one's gonna be? Fetch, man. We might get through all these today, if these last four or anything like that. I know it won't stop itching. The not so little mermaid. Ah, oh, so hot. I feel like I'm gonna melt. Pauline said, flopping back into the ground beside me. She was having nothing but trouble on her search, and it seemed to be taking its toll. Oh, this is Pauline and like the like the boy that she helped, right? It looked as scorching hot as it felt. The sun hung high in the clear blue sky, shining its light down on us in the clear blue ocean before us. You're wearing five layers of la layers, and your hair's as long as heck. Why did you expect? Cut half it off, you're so hot. A girl doesn't cut her hair on a whim, young man. Yeah, yeah, whatever you say, lady. She was more than a few years too old to be calling herself a girl, and I told her as much before, even if she still acted half her age. I'd never met another lady in her 20s that seemed so childish. I guess I'll just have to go for a swim. You, you what? You're... Turn around for a sec, ja Javi. Make sure no one comes this way, okay? Pauline said, undoing her top. Fetch! What? You? Hey! I said, my voice cracking. It happened so suddenly, I barely had time to process. I So I just did the only thing I could think of, which she told me to do. You can look now. I can look my butt! I wanted to snap about a thousand things at once, but my irritation fizzled out at the sight of her playing in the water. Her feminine curves, less pronounced but still distinct through the water. 
her white, mostly untanned skin, her long black hair bouncing in the waves. It was a lot for me to take in. Dang it. At best, I was like a little brother to her. And at only 14, I was most likely just a baby in her eyes. Stupid sheltered woman, you don't understand what guys are really like. Huh? Did you say something, Javi? Nope, you're just hearing things, doofus. Hold on. Didn't she say the man she was searching for was her lover? Then maybe she really did understand guys better than I thought. It kinda pissed me off to think about. Ugh, I hate you, Pauline. I muttered under my breath. I'd still never called Pauline by her name to her face. Are you serious? That's all that one was? Holy crap. All right. Well, that was another fast one. The Maid and the Beast. Oh boy, this is gonna be stretching my vocal cords. Oh, that music. The Maid and the Beast. As soon as I started learning how to talk, the human woman began bombarding me with questions. After we finished weeding a section of the garden and returned to the mansion, she would waste no time asking. What would you like for supper? Followed quickly by, how did you enjoy last night's supper? And, if I were to redecorate, is there any particular theme you would like to, to, me to adhere to? But she didn't stop at queries and only questionable significance. What is your favorite color? What is your favorite season? What is your favorite number? What is your favorite flower? I understood what she asked, but I didn't react to most of it. Because if I did, she would latch on to me like a fly to a carcass, and I did not want to deal with that. Besides, even if I could speak the human tongue fluently, it wouldn't suddenly make me talkative. That just wasn't me. Not to mention, it would be wrong for a beast and a human woman to be chatting together like friends. The human did not seem to comprehend my displays of disinterest, though. One day, she handed me a stick of charcoal and a slab of wood, saying, if words are too difficult, we can try pictures instead. Where has she even got these things? First, try drawing me. This is only practice, so do not worry about making it perfect. Draw however you wish. I wanted to crush the charcoal, smash the wood against the ground, and get away. But she started talking again before I had the chance. Sometime long, long ago, someone else painted a portrait of me as well. It was so, so very long ago. I sometimes I'm unsure whether it was real or merely a dream jumbled up in my memories. But I remember how it felt, how anxious they were drawing, and how delighted I was for them to be drawing me. And sitting here with you feels like it brings me ever so slightly closer to the woman I was then. The human woman often spoke of events that happened centuries ago, so this was hardly unusual for her. So please, so please, would you draw me? You doing so would help calm my spirits. If you'd rather not speak. All the ins insistence in the world would not make a beast any more capable of creating art. I wanted to throw the stool against the wall and storm out of the room, but the look in her eyes stopped me. Her gaze was more tenuous than usual, as though refusal would send her over the edge. I loathed it, so I took the charcoal in my unsteady hand. If a horrendous drawing from a horrendous beast would bring her back, then she would have her drawing. What I created, though, was nothing more than scratches of charcoal crudely imitating shapes. It hardly even resembled a child's doll, let alone her. Looking down on it with a soft laugh, the woman said, It's beautiful. I knew very little about the human woman, and I doubted that would ever change. Fetch, man! These things are just little chunky bites! <laughs> wow, we were as phasing through the sisterhood of secrets and then cup of kindness and then maybe we might just get through all the short stories today like if these two are just are that short or shorter like we're absolutely getting through the short stories today sisterhood of secrets let's get it going one afternoon a modest girls get together was held at the rose garden of the Rhodes estate it was far from the friendly gathering, though, as its members hardly uh, uh, hardly those one might expect to find sharing tea. Uh, everything's a secret with you, isn't it? Isn't there anything you can tell me? Stuffing another freshly baked cookie into her mouth, the Rhodes' daughter, Nellie, glowered at the white-haired girl, who looked as though she wanted to disappear. 
Beside her was an inscrutable smile on his on her face, said the black-haired head Abigail, oft spoke of in whispers of the Witch of Rose Manor. Uh, I'm truly sorry, Lady Nelly, said the white-haired girl, her gaze affixed to her, her hands clutched above her knees. Under normal circumstances, two Abigails and a young noble lady of the house which, uh, which they served would never be seen dining at the same table. Only at Nellie's insistence had they been brought together. Now, now, my lady, please be reasonable. Every girl has her secrets, said the head Abigail, her smile unwavering. She didn't look a day older than twenty, but supposedly she had served the house since Nellie's grandfather's time. There's secrets. Then there's not even being able to say what family you came from. Would your mother have brought her into this house if she posed any danger? Or do you not trust your mother's judgment, Nellie? I do, but still. Then you didn't concern yourself with her? The head Abigail's smile remained firm, as though carved from her on her face. Nellie pouted, seemingly stripped of the energy to pursue the subject any further. So instead, she raised a new topic of conversation. Okay, fine. Let's talk about something that isn't a secret. Like, hmm... What is it in someone that makes your heart flutter? Nellie leaned across the table, her face practically in the white-haired girls. But the only response she received was downturned eyes and bitten lips. Fine, you don't have to, said Nellie, turning toward the head, head Abigail. But in her place, you do. It had struck Nellie that in her entire life she'd never heard so much of as a whisper about this woman's private affairs. The head Abigail was rather pretty, though, which she imagined invited men's advances quite often. What makes my heart flutter, you ask? Let us see. I am rather fond of pearly white skin, unusual eye colors, and ethereal... Pardon me, I must really be going. The mistress needs my assistance. Good day, said the white-haired girl, scrambling from her chair and back toward the mansion. To which the head Abigail gave a slothly sinister laugh. Does every woman in this house have some deep, dark secret, thought Nellie. And it would not be long before she realized that she too could control could could count herself among them. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> Dang, man. And a cup of kindness. Cup of day keeps the doctor away. Ah, oh, it's a Jacopo one. Jazz time. Cup of kindness. For you. Marie was lounging in the kitchen with some of the other maids after a long day when, out of the blue, she was summoned into the hall by the master of the house. He shoved a paper bag branded with his name, with the name of an expensive restaurant into her hand, and the pieces fell into place. He'd gone out with the mistress today, and had apparently decided to bring a gift back. She poked at the bag, rustled it, shook it a bit, trying to guess what was inside to no avail. What's in here? Like nuts or something? It's really heavy. Close. They're beans. Coffee beans, that is. Ooh, she said, and then after a pause, I appreciate it, but you could have just given them to the head maid. Why would I do that? They're for you. The girls get suspicious if I suddenly start drinking expensive coffee. You're better off making a gift to everyone. The last thing I want to deal with is a bunch of spiteful women. With a disappointed frown, Jacobo said, I'm sorry, I didn't think it through. Jeez, was the sky going to fall tonight? Jacobo was never this meek. He must have had a pretty darn good day. A little while later, as the rest of the maids had begun dispersing to their chambers, the time the, the this time the mistress came to visit. She was dressed in her nightwear, her hair down, her makeup removed, and she was just as pre uh, preternaturally beautiful as ever. The white-haired girl could be dressed in rags and she would be still be prettier than most girls. Sorry to bother you so late, she said fidgeting. There was something I wanted to talk to you about. What's up? I'm all ears. The white-haired girl let out a sigh of relief, a smile spreading across her lips. Well... By the time she finished, Marie was almost on the floor. Holy... Holy crap! What are the two... What are you two? Twelve? She said, completely forgetting her manners. Evidently, the mister and mistress, newlyweds though they were, had yet to bed together. Marie knew that they'd had a long... Had, lo had a lot going on and hadn't managed to cons consummate their marriage on their wedding day, but still... That was no excuse for this. Not to, not to mention, sees one coming from me for advice. God, is he completely useless? Marie let out an exaggerated sigh, shaking her head. When she caught sight of the bag of coffee beans, which gave her an idea. Alright, how about this? I'll make you this great cup of coffee, and you take that, and... 
A smirk spread across Marie's face as she imagined the look on Jacopo's the next morning. Oh, this is gonna be good. The storm which would only one which would one day befall them was but a speck on the horizon, their hearts still free of darkness. Oh man. Well, okay. <laughs> and with those short, very interesting stories, we are here. Didn't know we would be here so quickly. But we're brought to the beginning once again. The Revenant Stream. The final prelude before we start reincarnation in full force. I hope you guys are ready. It does mean that this episode is probably going to be short because I don't think the Revenant Stream is supposed to be that long. And we're going to end here because I'm not starting that. Um, I'm not starting reincarnation until next week because I got it'd be a half job if we start it now. We go in ten minutes and have to stop. I'm not doing that. So let's start Revenant Stream and collect our thoughts and prepare for what's to come. I'm kind of glad I accidentally saved this one for last. Farewell, Jacopo. Until our souls cross paths once more in the boundless sphere of fate. Goodbye, Morgana. She believed that was the end of it all. That by releasing their souls from the curse, they would all return to their rightful places. That the realm containing the cursed mansion would dissipate, and the natural order of the world would take care of the rest. Both she and the good-hearted young man who had guided her to her salvation believed that. But the young man underestimated how strong his love was. And the girl underestimated how wholly and thoroughly he blamed himself. He sent her off and then remained in place. He could not forgive himself for what he'd done. And so he did not deserve to move on. The Revenant Stream. The next thing she realized, she was in a field of gold. Wheat rolling in the wind like golden, like a golden ocean. The sky blue as sapphire. The breeze almost startlingly warm. It was an unbelievably gentle view, and one she did not recognize. She'd never seen this place before. Never been there before. Yet, looking out at it now, she felt emotional. It was almost terrifyingly beautiful. And as if it was drawn in by it, the girls took a step forward. With each subsequent step, the soft sound of crunching beneath her feet grew more distinct. Evidently, her soul had been taking physical form, and it was her body from life that had been had, that the golden ocean created for her. She raised her left arm, which had been severed before she was placed in captivity. It was whole. Still uncertain, she placed a hand on her cheek. There, she found none of the scars or the rough texture of the markings that had caused her so much torment in life. What is going on here? She was perplexed. Where was this place? When was it? And what was she doing here, in that form no less? The girl continued walking, in spite of her consternation. In spite of herself at that. It was the gentlest domains that had always caused her the most pain. The most pleasant memories were the sharpest knives. If her life had taught her one thing, it was that. And from then on, she had done everything in her power to eliminate those things. Which was why she had locked the warmly inviting master bedroom in the cursed mansion and threw the key into the painting. But now, she was being drawn into another such realm. She felt as though she needed to push forward. And soon, as she approached the far edge of the wheat field, she caught sight of a figure. Seeing it, she stopped dead with a gulp. She knew what this world was. It was his world. Much like she had crafted her own realm to contain her curse, he too had built himself a world of illusion. Upon reaching this realization, a flood of images and memories rushed over her. But this was not unusual, as she had experienced projections of others' memories in the cursed mansion as well. The living and the dead perceived the world differently. For a while, for a while their living were bound by their bodies, the dead were bound by recollections and emotions. Nonetheless, it had been Michelle, not her. Who had dived into this memory, memory, into the memories directly? So this was her first time truly experiencing the phenomena herself, though she was uncertain as to whether the experience was intensified by her own involvement in these specific memories. They were of her as a child, of the young man applying ointment to her face every day for three years. She would claim it unnecessary, insult him, complain in any way she could, but still the young man came back the next day. Even on days she fought to the point of truly, truly angering him, he still applied the ointment. He was a strange man, she thought. For what purpose did he pay her so much mind? No other man wanted to get near her. 
The hideous scars covering her face were quite an effective deterrent, and most would have probably cut off their own hands before volunteering to touch them. He alone was different, though. One day, he chastised her for making the track to the graveyard even uh, every day in rain or snow or anything in between. But she realized how this, that his criticism applied to him as well. In the pouring rain or in the midst of a blizzard, the wind so strong they could knock a grown man to the ground or even when he was hurt to sick to, or sick to himself, he never missed a day coming to find her at the graveyard. Next, she saw the rising sun being carried on his back, traveling a different path home than the one she knew. The stench of decomposing flesh unavoidable in the alleys of the slums. Her surroundings utterly repugnant, yet the sunrise oddly enchanting. The sun's light even reaches this deep, dark corner of the world. I mean, of course it does, but... I don't know, for some reason, it seems particularly bright today. She said nothing in response, but she felt the same way. She had spent her whole life looking down at her feet, never taking the time to look up and appreciate the sky. And she likely never would have either. Never been able to see the beauty in the rising sun without the nudge. And subsequently, whenever the evil lord would show himself in her dreams, she, would be, she was able to close her eyes and block him out. Until eventually she was no longer able to remember his face or the sound of his voice. Her wounds were at last beginning to heal. He had given her so much. An ordinary life, an ordinary happiness. Their freedom from having to be special. A warmth she had never known before. <sighs> but those memories only served to salt her wounds. Every image of the slave boy showing her kindness was another crack in, the, in her foundation. I can't. He killed me. With the same hands he had used to treat her wounds, he later took her life. It tainted all her memories shattered the illusion of warmth, ruined her all the way down to her soul, turned everything into hatred and anger, a fury so intense that even the young saint's unconditional love was insufficient to assuage it. The only reason she had managed to maintain her composure at the very end was because Michelle was there with her, holding her hand. She would not have gone to see him at all otherwise. But now she was alone, so she would leave. She had no interest in seeing that man again. And when she made it to head back the way she had come, she caught a glance at the shadowy figure's condition. It was beaten, broken, crumbling away. She looked down in silence on the shadow, who's barely maintained its own form. She had seen souls decay of this state before, such as Michelle's when he arrived at the mansion after centuries lost, broken down and reformed again and again with only Giselle's voice as his guide. By the time he found his way there, he was unrecognizable. Hardly a wisp of a spirit, incapable of individual thought, blindly following Giselle's lead. She understood why Michel's soul had taken so much damage. He had been abused and mistreated to an unimaginable degree his entire life. It made sense that he would wish for an ending more permanent than even death. But him... What are you doing so broken? She could not understand why he'd brought, what had brought him to this point. He was the perpetrator. A monster. No matter how kind he'd been to her before, that did not change what he had done after that. So what did he think he was doing, looking so mangled and beaten? If she left him there, before long his soul would disappear for good. Rubbed out of existence, never to return to the boundless sphere of fate. Good. Let him. She bit her lip. Yes, let him. Then she would be free of his torture once and for all. She would never have to see him again. Never have to torment herself with the thoughts of him. And what a relief that would be. So she turned on, So she tried to turn back, but her body would not let her. An emotion she did not understand had welled up in her breast. It was pity, though she could not put a name to it herself. It was an emotion she had never felt during her time as a witch. And in fact, were the witch here, she would have cack cack cackled joyously at the sight. Pointing a skeletal finger at the pathetic thing that had become an, how he had become and telling him how much he deserved it. But she was no longer that witch. And furthermore, she had been blessed with an unconditional love by Michelle and Giselle. And the benevolent portion of her soul, which, she had been, which had been rent from her at the creation of the white-haired girl, was beginning to return to its rightful place. She thought she had heard a voice from within, telling her that only she could save him. She frowned, 
Why should she have to save him after all the pain and suffering he had caused for her? The voice within spoke. Michelle had stepped forward to save her after all the pain and suffering she'd put him through. Giselle, too, held no grudge after being imprisoned in a mansion by her for centuries, happily joining Michelle in his quest. She took a single step forward. The wheat swayed as she did, making the scene even more dreamlike. Initially, she had been irritated to find him here, trying to hide from his sins in the realm of illusion. But now, she was beginning to realize that this was not the case. His memories and feelings flowed over her with more clarity this time. This was what he could have had if he had not made all those mistakes. And this was the place he had hoped to show her one day. He was not hiding from his sins. He was attempting to atone for them. He had condemned his sins, lamented his failures, and forced himself to look at this vision of the world he had let slip through his fingers. Again and again until he had destroyed his soul. This was his punishment for himself. And not only for what he had done to Morgana, but her other half, the white-haired girl, as well. She had said in a letter that she wished to see his homeland, and he had failed to see, see that through as well. Twice he had broken what he was supposed to care about most. Twice he had crushed her. And he could never forgive himself for that. Not even after she had released him from her curse. You truly are the biggest fool in all the world. She had never in all her time seen more a disaster of a man. I don't know, man. Take a look at me sometime. Though she was beginning to realize that part of re the reason he had done this to himself was because she had rejected his offer to make amends. Told him she would not punish him any further. Not to mention, he was not entirely at fault for his actions in the second life. She had wished to see his life in ruins. She had, in a sense, placed him on the path herself. But he was not one who could place the blame for his actions on others. Everything was always his responsibility, and his alone. He was like this from his first life, and his second, and in the illusionary alternate scenario where Michel intervened. Ultimately, I'm the one responsible, he said on the March to, the Aton March to Atonement. And I suppose, to make sure their li next lives go a little better, he said, excluding himself from any potential redemption. So what though? What though? That doesn't change what he did. Are you saying I should have set him off with a smile? That I should have set him, uh, set aside my hated, hatred to make a man who hurt me feel better? She took another step toward the uh, uh, amorphous shadow, still unsure of her own position. The closer she got, the more she wanted to run away. What would she say? What would she do? She had not an inkling of an idea. Not a single fully formed thought about what came after this. The shade noticed her, lifting its head. She tensed up. It was hideous, hardly even recognizable as human. But she could tell somehow that it was smiling at her. It must have been made up of all the things he had wanted to do for her, she thought. The shade seemed to think she was part of the illusion. In that case, she thought. In that case, she could play along with it. Pretending she was another phantom in this dreamscape would reduce the pressure on her, giving her time to think. Though in truth, she likely wanted to indulge in the fantasy herself. The long lost possibility of nothing going wrong, of him finding their of him of him finding their homeland. Even knowing it was all sham and a significant sliver of a dream, she probably still wanted to partake in its warmth. And maybe then she'd be able to give him a genuine smile. So, what's on the agenda for today? Initially, she only intended to play along with the illusion, but in time she found herself being drawn into the dream world as well. A fantasy where he had never become the lord, she never the witch, and both of them lived an uneventful lives in their undiscovered homeland. It was pleasant and peaceful, and she soon began enjoying it in earnest. She had turned off her mind, simply started accepting things as they happened which she was only able to do because he was hardly recognizable as himself. She felt as if she had really gone back to being a 16-year-old girl, like she had grown up a normal life not filled with tragedy. And oh, how wonderful that would have been if this could have been true. He asked her to sing for him, so she brought him into the shade of the large tree. He told her he had borrowed a lute, but he held nothing in his amphomorbic amphomorbic amorphous hands, so she merely played along. 
In his vision of this realm, there were others like us for him to borrow from. They sat down in the shade of the tree and sang. Only her voice carried the tune. Like Michelle in the same condition, the shade was barely able to produce any coherent sound, let alone music. But still, she could tell what he was trying to say and how he was saying it. The longer she spent in this realm of illusion, the more her own state of mind reverted to those days. Those three years when she'd been able to experience happiness like anyone else. But continuing until she reached the age of 16. She was smiling and laughing, though she hardly realized it herself. Nor did she recall that she had explicitly told him previously that she could not smile for him. In time, she even found herself able to speak of her younger days as something she had not told him even in life. How she was known as the saint. How her blood had miraculous powers. And the people of her village began worshipping her for it. She had, on some level, wanted to talk about that with him in life. Wanted to open herself to him more. Wanted him to know more of who she really was. You're just an ordinary girl. He spoke in an unearthly voice, like a thousand of rocks scraping one another. But to her ears, it was the sound of the young slave man's voice. He slightly exasperated, always gentle tone. She smiled. You've said as much as so many times now, I'm almost beginning to believe it. She said, wondering if he would have been, able, been the one to give her warmth if things had gone differently. Obviously, that was but a hypothetical future, and one they could never have uh, ever reached, no less. But she had softened up enough to entertain such silly fantasies. She also thought about her homeland. Not the small, isolated village where she had been born, but someplace further up her bloodline. Her real father's home. Would you like to meet him? She was telling him of her father when, she suddenly a when he suddenly asked her that. She was not sure, and she was racked her brain in consideration. It was something she really needed to think about. There was no family here to, for her to find anymore, after all. But she had indulged herself so deeply in the past that she really was not a concern. That reality was not a concern. She spoke of her father with a hint of sadness in her voice, to which the shade responded with a sudden surge of rage. The whole dreamscape warped around him, and the metallic smell of blood permeated the region. He wanted to seek out her father and mete out divine justice, and the world had twisted to fit his image. Any form of violence is forbidden. She shouted, attempting to calm his fury. Not even if it's for my sake, she continued. Any time he'd managed to obtain any form of power, he had let, it, had let him down the path of destruction. He knew no other way to wield it. And it became doing, and it, and because doing so had shown to be effective in accomplishing his immediate goals, he'd never bothered to look for any other solutions, which ultimately resulted in him being unable to trust anyone, because he only understood power as a blunt object. He was a soft, cowardly man deep down, but because he'd learned to kill. I don't want you to hurt anyone else ever again. The more he hurt others, the more he hurt himself. This was the lesson that was long, long overdue for him. The shadow started at her in silence for several minutes, as the blood fiery rage twisted the illusionary realm slowly receded. When it was gone, the shade too seemed to have returned to normal, nodding and saying, All right, I won't. She let out a sigh of relief. She had slipped entirely back into her childhood. They talked more about everything and nothing, such as the Midsummer Festival, the memory of which had filled her with yearnings for those times. When everyone was still together, him, his friend Marie, his companion Gratine, and an eternally cheerful Jaren. She was never terribly fond of the gatherings of many people, and that had not changed even now, but she was able to reminisce about it and admit that it had not been entirely awful. That it had been an important, formative moment of her youth, and probably the same for the rest of them as well. The three girls holding hands, dancing in a circle, him playing a tune on the lute, and his friend providing a beat. It was a marvelous day. As she reflected, she realized she had been chasing overly ambitious, uh, overly ambitious dreams from the very beginning. All his talk of going out into the world, taking her with him, and he was no different than her in the realm of illusion. Eventually, she grew tired of hearing his fantasies, telling him, Climb down off your high horse and adjust. If he was going to keep chasing after stupid dreams, she would laugh at him every time. If he was going to keep chasing after impossible ideals, she would drag him back down to earth. That way, he would never... Then I'll just have to find a new dream. Excuse me? 
Her mouth hung open in a mixture of exasperation and shock, and perhaps a trace of anger. She wanted to shout, tell him that all his idiotic dreams ended with shambles. But he seemed unable to pick up on her trepidation, continuing unfazed. I'm gonna win your heart. She stood aghast. That was the last thing she'd ever expected to hear from him. Even knowing this whole world was his fantasy about what he wished he could have done for her. She was conflicted. She felt many things, but flattered was the line she would never cross. No matter how much she had reverted to her younger self here, her present self still remained. You murdered me. There's nothing you can do to win my heart. Not a single thing. She found herself very close to saying what she felt. But she set her agitation aside and let the dream continue a bit longer. For her own peace of mind more than his. From that point, he became almost impressively brazen, even asking her to call him by his name, to which she frowned and said, in no uncertain terms, Why would I waste my breath? Visibly disheartening him. After some time having to watch him mope, she could bear it no longer and attempted to raise a new subject. But whether she asked him about learning to play the lute or going fishing together, the only response she ever received was a half-hearted nod. She sighed, at a complete loss. And then the shadow spoke. Will you say my name? Again. Why was he so fixated on this stupid and significant thing? But as he continued, she realized. His request was more pitiful and heart heartfelt than she had ever heard from him. I don't want you to forget. She gasped. I don't want you to forget me again. Cracks developed in the shadow. I don't want you to forget what I look like. It wavered, shook, crumbled. The sound of the sound of my voice. But still he pleaded desperately. Or how I feel or how I feel about you. The man who refused to learn lean on anyone was begging for her validation. I don't want you to forget what we talked about. They were all things she had long since forgotten about him. What kind of man I was. The things she had locked away in the deepest recesses of her mind. Or all the time we shared together. Gosh darn it, no! <laughs> I didn't think, ah! Uh. Memories overflowed with so much warmth they hurt. Please. She cast it all out. His name, his face, everything. Don't forget me. Which was what had allowed her to mistake him for the Lord. She felt a chill listening to the shade beg and plead endlessly. What was she supposed to do here? At the very least, this meant the end of the peaceful, trouble-free illusion. Why would you ask me that now? She said, her voice strained. I was hoping to... Uh, I was hoping to... I was hoping to bask in the illusion a while longer. The shadow said nothing. He simply sat there, waiting for her answer. She mulled over the question for a while, then took another step toward it. She was close enough to touch it now, but she would never do that. A feeling welled up in her breast, a mixture of wanting to scream and burst into tears and throw things around like a small child. She forced it back, looking down on the shade. If I had remembered, would anything have been any different? Could we not have ended up so far down the wrong... Could we have not ended up so far down the wrong path? If I had gone and found you, would that have stopped you from becoming what you did? There were a thousand things she could have done differently. If, after taking up the cottage on the lake, she had gone into town even once, she could have found out that they had a new lord. Maybe he would have been the one to send her the, had, had been sent the knight to visit her cottage, who she had sent away without talking to. Not to mention, if she had only told him about her childhood, the rumors about her blood having healing powers, he would have been able to make a connection between her and the Lakeside Witch. If she had done something, maybe she could have stopped him from veering off the straight and narrow. In fact, she likely was the only person who could have stopped him. Why am I blaming myself for his mistakes? He's the one who's responsible for his choices. She did not know what to do. She had been able to lost her ever since learning the truth. The answer had only brought her more pain. And so she'd buried them away somewhere out of sight. Ah, oh, that must be why. That must have been why she had not yet returned to her rightful place. Why she had been brought unto salvation by the hands of an angel ceased being a witch. The girl inside was as wounded suffering as ever. Can I hold your hand? The shade resumed its pleading. 
its desperation clawing at her chest. And so, rather coldly denying her request, she found herself saying, Do as you please. The shadow slowly extended its hand up to hers, as if scared. It was not playing its part very well. This was supposed to be a dream, where nothing had gone wrong between them after all. But the illusion had begun to give way to harsh reality. The reality of having murdered the girl he loved. The reality of having been brutally abused and killed by the man she had leaned on for support. They had both once cared for each other in a very similar way. Yet the end result was not love, but terrible tragedy. He was terrific. To sh it was, he was terrified to show someone affection with his hands that had only ever brought destruction. And so before he did, he said, I promised I would never touch you without your permission. She knew it was just an excuse, though, and he was simply afraid. Worried about putting his bloodied hand on her. That he might hurt her again. That he might corrupt her. That he had no right to. But he overcame all that, gently placing his arm around hers. As if he had been waiting for centuries for this moment. It was an embrace of many things. Love for her, deep regret, and most of all, atonement. He wanted to do this. In his arms, she could feel everything he felt. Since the day I locked his soul in that mansion. She thought back to that time, the unfathomable amount of time she'd spent as the witch, a force of pure hatred and vengeance. He was the last soul she entrapped, and when she did, he was little more than an amor am am amorphous shadow. It took many, many years for him to regain a human form, but even then, he was unable to move or speak. He simply wailed something incomprehensible at her again and again. At the time, I thought he was saying how much he hated me. But she was wrong. He had simply wanted to atone, but he had no idea how. Look at you, a grown man shaking like a fawn. At the shadow, shadows, as the shadow embraced her, it trembled, sobbing loudly into her shoulder. She had never seen him cry before, though she was unsure if this counted, since she could only feel it through the nebulous shade. Sometimes I can't, sometimes I can't tell if you have a heart of stone or glass. Her entire body went limp. All the tension in her nerves released at once, and she felt like a massive weight had been lifted from her shoulders. Though, I suppose I'm not terribly different in that regard. Unable to even speak my heart, unless there's no one else around. Unable to face you, except through this childish fantasy. Not even able to show any vulnerability. Maybe. She hated to even entertain the thought, but perhaps they were more similar than she wanted to admit. Some time long ago, in the memories that she had banished away, he told her that being close made people more open with each other. And it turned out he was right about that. She began to speak. To tell him the truth of how she felt, letting spill raw forth the raw pain withheld, holding nothing back. She told him how she despised him more than anything in the world, because he showed her happiness and the depths of despair, that she had no idea what to do with him, how she did regret some of her actions, such as the misdire misdirected her anger. He was consumed by regret over what he had done to her, but he was not the only one who had regrets and their minds and spirits intermingled, the true shape of her wounds grew apparent. He had hurt her, but she had hurt him too. She'd blamed him, not only for his own sins, but for the sins of another man as well. And for that, she had laughed at him, cursed him, mocked him for trying to show something resembling care for another human being, again and 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 again. And again. I should have known better than anyone how much he was capable of caring, though. She thought back to the decisive moment. Knowing the truth now, she finally understood the full effect of things she had said. To even an even greater degree than Michelle had told her. She. She had told the man who had spent three years looking after her, coming to apply ointment to her scarred face, rain or snow, that she despised him with all her soul. That he had ruined her life. She had not been seeing clearly at the time, but he had been tethering on the edge as well, and her saying that had been the final push. It was my words that ultimately pushed you over the edge, wasn't it? <sighs> How had it all ended up like this? Why did they have to hurt each other so much? 
What was the turning point that sent them so far off the path? He continued holding onto her for some time, pleading for a chance to make amends, spilling his heart, clinging to her like a little child. It was something he could have never done in life, or even in death. It was only after repeatedly crushing himself beneath overwhelming regret until he was mangled and hardly recognizable that he was able to show her his weakness. That he was able to show her his tears. But it was far too late. It was all over. Nothing he asked for was something she could give him. No matter how much he begged, she could never stop hating him. Could never forgive him. Fissures began to form in her spirit. Memories of her youth brought, to, brought with them emotions long lost. Of the time she first directly acknowledged his kindness. It was a bitter, sweet, agonizing, suffocating, innocent feeling. Many, many ages ago when I was... Many, many ages ago when I was still a child, I looked up to you. The sunrise she saw that morning carried on his back only seemed as beautiful as it did because he had shown it to her. She then grew to yearn the lost homeland he spoke of and admire his lofty dreams and feel warmth in his hands as he spread the ointment. That was when the seed was planted, not only of the ability to feel joy, but love as well. I might have even had some fondness for you. And having said that, she noticed the clear droplet trolling down her cheeks. After Michelle finished unveiling the truth, she shouted, I cried for him in a frenzy, and those tears she had shed contained all her feelings for him. On the day of her twelfth birthday, that terrible tragic day, she cried and told the man in the slave cart, I'm sad because I didn't get a chance to show my gratitude to people very dear to me. And that was true. She was grateful to not only the young slave man, but to the girls of the brothel as well. She had wanted to open up to them, but the larger portion of her tears were just for one person. She cried for him. She cried for the man who had spent so long trying to help her. She cried because she had not been able to thank him. She cried because she believed him to be dead. She cried for him then. So who did she cry for now? Were these tears for him as well? Were they for herself? No. They were for both of them. She decided to let the illusion continue a while longer. She knew it was foolish. She had mixed feelings about being here and interacting with him as she had when she was younger. But she had softened up enough to not simply ignore the warmth as it made her feel. She had found herself to accept the seed of kindness sprouting within her. She had found it in herself to acknowledge how he felt. So she would use the dream to lead him to his next destination. Under a guise of him holding her hand and leading her out of the claws of this foolish fantasy to be released once and for all. She would guide him back into the void, that boundless sphere of fate, so that he might live again. They set off through the fields, a waving gold. She squeezed her eyes shut, envisioning the young man she once knew, that when she opened them again, he was there, holding her hand and smiling softly at her. You know, Jacopo, I really hope we don't ever cross paths again. Nothing good could possibly come from us beating in the next life. I'm tired of having to deal with you. I hate you, and I pray I never have to see you again. But should you wish to see me, and should that wish take priority over my own, promise you'll treat me well. And if you can manage that, then I... And... Gosh darn it, I didn't think it was going to be that hard to hear. Okay. Ugh. Ugh. Fetch, man. It was the other side of the special ending we got in... <sighs> Requiem. Fetch, man. And here we are at the end of all these short stories. The last one not being very short, but I don't care. It was beautiful. And the manly tears that I didn't anticipate coming today, <laughs> they're here. So yeah, 
Thank you so much for being here today. Hope you enjoyed that. A lot of those short stories were just little nuggets of happiness and interest, you know? But that ending was freaking beautiful. And it sets the stage. It sets the stage for reincarnation. We're gonna have to see what plays out there. Maybe it hinted at the fact that maybe they do meet again. I truly thought that Morgana doesn't get reincarnated. It implied that she chose not to. But maybe the decision was changed in the end. Because also in that short story of Giselle and Michelle, when they like move into his parents' house or set of houses, it kind of implied that Morgana joined them there. So if that was the case, then perhaps they will cross paths again. And what that will be, that'll be interesting. But we'll have to wait till next time. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful viewers and sharing these journeys with me. We've lately had a few people who have started messaging me just asking questions and talking to me about stuff. And it's been wonderful to hear from each of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me directly. Especially in the Discord, it's really easy to see you there. Um, thank you to the patrons. You guys help make this channel amazing and help me get through each and every day and every week. So I can keep making the content I do. I appreciate that support. It means the world to me. And I hope you guys know that. I'm grateful for you all. And I'm grateful to share this journey with you. So until the next video, watching me up to see me next. I'll see you there.